Our next speaker will be speaking on walking circumspectly and lay hands suddenly on no man, keeping with the general theme of being faithful to the Lord and how to do that in the Lord's church. Brother Pogue is a native of Liberty Hill, Texas, and he preached his first sermon when he was 14. And Brother Dub was telling me that when Noah and him, Noah when they got off the ark, and him discussed hearing that sermon when he was 14, they knew he had a great future. He began, <laughs> he began preaching uh, on every Sunday in uh, Briggs, Texas when he was 15 years old. He is a 1995 graduate of Memphis School of Preaching and has preached either full-time or by appointment in the gospel meetings in numerous states since then. He currently preaches for the Cedar Street Congregation in Granby, Missouri. He's authored numerous tracts and books and has in articles published in several Brotherhood papers and bulletins. He's spoken on several lectureship programs. He loves to write songs. He says that's one of his hobbies. And he, with his wife Linda, she's here with us, they assist in the publication of the weekly bulletin of the uh, Burnett, Texas Church of Christ. Charles and Linda have been married 38 years. They have two children and six great six great grandchildren. Grandchildren. You have great grandchildren, do you? Oh yeah. Well, you know, I got myself sort of fooled when I talked about Noah and all that, and I thought it might be a lot. Anyway. <laughs> What's that? Right. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> you feel better now, Dub? <laughs> Don't look any better, but the rest of the... so, Brother Pogue, let's get serious now and speak, walking circumspectly and laying hands suddenly on old men. Come preach to us, please. What a good sermon we heard uh, last hour. If I were an individual who did not know how to pay a compliment, I would say the only thing harder than following a garbage truck might be following Dub. Seriously, that was uh, a great lesson. We appreciate it very much. I learn something new every time I come home to Texas. This time I learned that my name is not what I have been thinking it was all this time. My name is only. Cars were going by me like this. And then just down the road a little bit farther, I saw a sign that said, left lane for passing only. So. <laughs> I'm very thankful to be here. This lectureship is so very, very important, and I appreciate the invitation. And I'm glad that my wife is here, and if you don't mind, I'm going to brag on her for just a minute. About two or three weeks ago, we received a card in the mailbox informing us that we needed to go to Joplin and pick up a package at UPS. We drove over there. She went in and came out with a, a box. She opened it up, and there was a college textbook in there, three copies of it, and the author's name at the bottom of it was Linda Pogue. And I'm so proud of what she has been able to accomplish. In fact, I, I need her. I need her with me. A few weeks ago, I needed her very badly. We stopped on our way to somewhere uh, for gasoline. If she had not been with me, I would still be trying to figure out how to get out of that pickup. I could not find the door handle, but um, fortunately, I had her. Walking circumspectly and lay hands suddenly on no man. 
Obedience to the gospel of Christ and practicing those things that are pleasing to our God. That's walking circumspectly, isn't it? And these things have to do with how the Christian remains faithful to God. Many things are involved in remaining faithful to God and to Christ. Of course, one has to come into the proper relationship with God and with His Son through obedience to the gospel. But then he must maintain that in both religious practice, as we would say it, and in the way that he conducts his life as it relates to that which is good and evil. He must do that which is right and not do that which is evil. So in order to do that and to walk circumspectly and in addition to that laying hands uh, suddenly on no man, there are some things that are required of us to know. This statement, to walk circumspectly, of course, is found in Ephesians 5 and verse number 15. But I want us to notice before we look at that, that the word walk is actually found three times in Ephesians 5. And if we look at those three things, and especially the first 17 verses of that chapter, and then we go back and we look at chapter 4 along with it. What a, I wish I had an hour just to talk about Ephesians chapters 4 and 5, but that's not our uh, mission of, of this hour. But these three verses that have the word walk in them, first of all, it's verse 2, and walk in love. Walk in love as Christ hath loved us. And what has he done? He has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, for a sweet-smelling savor. Surely we can see in that verse that there is an incentive to walk circumspectly. Walk in love as Christ hath loved us. It is amazing, isn't it, for a person to be aware of the fact that Christ went to the cross, gave himself as the sacrifice for that individual's sin, and then that individual turn around and say, I'm not really going to walk the way he wants me to walk. What a disrespect for the very love of Christ and, and the love of God the Father to have such an attitude. There's the incentive that Christ loved us. In verse 8 then, for we were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There is the standard for our walk. As John describes it in 1 John 1, verses 6 and 7, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then he goes on and he says that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Walk in the light. The light is the truth of God's word. And that is how we are to walk. And so then we come to verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Verse 15 actually ends in the middle of the sentence, which the next verse completes, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That was true the day that Paul penned those words, and it is 
true today. And in that passage, we not only find the instruction to walk in the light, it describes the character, if you please, of those who walk in the light. They are wise, as opposed to being fools. And it gives us one reason to walk circumspectly. That is that the days are, in fact, evil. Paul has already expounded upon that in the previous chapter, as we mentioned a while ago. And in that chapter, Paul instructs the Ephesians, don't walk as other Gentiles walk. Well, Paul, how did they walk? They walked in the vanity of their minds, alienated from God, in ignorance, and blindly. Nothing's changed. It's still the same way today. The world about us walks in a false plan of salvation, as Brother Dub so eloquently uh, mentioned in that marvelous lesson last hour. That plan of salvation basically excludes the commands of God, particularly, and as he mentioned, baptism. But we must be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, washed in his precious blood. Revelation 1 5. But that's not what men teach. But neither do they teach that one needs to walk as wise in terms of being good as opposed to being evil. Well, commit any sin you want to, you're still going to be saved. Once saved, always saved. You remember last month, the judge up in that area ordered the John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth to disconnect the pregnant woman from the life support system. And I listened over the internet to talk radio from our, my beloved home state. I listened to KLBJ out of Austin. And one of the morning hosts on there is a retired Austin police officer by the name of Sam Cox and he purports himself to be a very religious man well he rightly condemned the action of the woman's husband for wanting his child to be killed but then he turned right around in the next breath and said we'll see that man in heaven You see, you don't have to walk circumspectly according to the people of this world, and that includes those who are to some degree religious. But we're to walk circumspectly. Well, what is that? We've gone this long, and we've mentioned this word a number of times. What is it? My guess is that circumspectly is a word that you did not use in conversation today. Probably not yesterday, maybe not even the day before that or the day before that. What is it? Circumspectly is found only one time in the New Testament, and that's right here in our text. Ephesians 5, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. But it's also found without the L-Y, one time in the Old Testament, that's at Exodus 23, 13, which says, And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. The word circumspect there means to watch, 
to observe or to take heed. Now the Greek word in Ephesians 5.15 has the same general meaning. Thayer comments on it to live carefully, deviating in no respect from the law of duty. We generally and accurately so extrapolate from that that we are to walk precisely, accurately, and diligently. But let's go back from Ephesians 5. 15 to the beginning of that chapter and notice a few things it begins by saying be followers of God now if it is the case and it is that God does not do anything that is contradictory to his nature his nature is good, and he does not do that which is evil, and I am to be a follower of God, then how am I supposed to walk? Circumspectly, accurately, precisely, diligently, as God would have me to walk. After Paul makes this statement about being followers of God, he goes on to explain that such a thing demands that we walk in that love that he mentions, as Christ loved us. And then he says, there are certain things that are not to be named among us as saints. These things include fornication uncleanness, covetousness, foolish talking, jesting, whoremongering, and covetousness, which, he says, is idolatry. But notice what he says about those who do those things. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Walk circumspectly. Yes, indeed. The child of God not only does not do those things, that is, he does not have any fellowship with those things, but Paul then says that he rebukes them. Have no fellowship, verse 11, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even reprove them. One of the things that I have noticed, and I would venture to say that you have too, in recent years, is the fact that people really don't care what someone else does. It's not any of my business what you do in the privacy of your own home, they will say. Who am I to judge? And by that they mean who am I to say that what you're doing is evil? Well, the fact of the matter is that we are going to be judged by the truth of God. And if we are going to be judged by that truth of God, that is the light, then we need to walk in it. And we also, if we're going to love the lost as we are instructed to do, we're going to have to judge whether or not there are things in their lives that need to be changed so that they too can be in fellowship with, with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ, if they've never obeyed the gospel. I've got to know that in order to preach the gospel to them. Why would I preach the gospel to them if they were already uh, those who were, were saved in the sight of God? And I can tell by my simple observation, by watching 
keeping my eyes open. I can tell those that I have contact with whether or not they're doing that which is good in the, in the sight of God or that which is evil in the sight of God. And I've got a responsibility to them. I have a responsibility to my brethren. If I see them walking in such a way that does not please God, it's my responsibility to go to them and say, look, there's something that needs to be changed here. There is a sin that's in, in your life that we need to discuss and we need to, to take care of this thing. This needs to be put away from you. That's my responsibility. Jesus said that he had to be about his father's business in Luke 2, 40, 49. So must we. Paul then says that the follower of God is not to sleep, but be awake. And Christ will give him light. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving? Does that have to do with walking circumspectly? Certainly it does. I cannot imagine, I cannot express how much it grieves the heart of God and of the faithful child of God that even most religious people scoff at the idea of walking circumspectly. I won't go into it in any detail here. We, we, we've got the conversation or email exchange in the book. But some time ago, Brother Ken Chumley, and by the way, keep Brother Ken in your prayers. He'll be having surgery next Monday, he told me a while ago, and, and we sure want to keep Brother Ken in our prayers. But he had an email exchange with an individual who basically told him, I don't really have time to study the New Testament. I don't have time to study what the Bible says. We hear our own brethren sometimes saying, I don't have time to argue the scriptures. I had, had a, a, a brother tell me that one time on the phone who had invited me to lunch and said, I want to discuss with you a, a sermon we'd like for you to preach on our Wednesday night of, uh, series this summer. And he told me the title of it. And I said, well... Let me, let me see if we're seeing eye to eye on this. He said, I don't have time to argue the scriptures. And he hung up the phone. He wasn't interested in walking circumspectly. The people of the world, they do not believe and follow the plan of salvation as is outlined and taught, revealed in the New Testament. They're not interested in what the New Testament teaches in Mark 16, 15, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, where Paul is told to rise and be baptized and wash away his sins in that precious blood of Christ once again. People rather teach this idea of salvation by faith alone. You know, I've always wondered about that. They say uh, we teach salvation by faith alone because if we were to put baptism in that, that would be a work of man and therefore it would nullify salvation by faith alone. But which one is me doing something? Having faith or having someone else baptize me? I'm not the smartest uh, nail in the box or the sharpest uh, nail in the box, but I think I can figure out that for me to have faith, there's something I do. But when someone else baptizes me, they are the one that's doing something. I'm having it done to me. And so I just don't, I don't understand the world's failure to understand that we're to obey God. There's also a sentiment 
among some members of the Lord's church that walking circumspectly is not even possible. We can't do that, you see, because we cannot know for sure what is essential and what is not. Why not? If we study the scriptures closely, we can tell the difference. And to say anything otherwise makes a mockery out of 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. When Peter said, according as the divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now listen very closely to what Peter says. That God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Why? That in doing them, we might become partakers of the divine nature. Now, what if I do not know and adhere to those things that have been revealed concerning life and godliness? And I don't do those things. Well... It, we can all conclude that means I'm not partaking in the divine nature. So it's rather, it's very distressing that we have among us those who do not believe that it's possible to walk circumspectly. And we never get far from Colossians 3.17, do we? Because whatever you do, word or deed, do all in the name of, by the authority of, the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks unto God and the Father by Him. Well, there's a lot more that could be said about walking circumspectly, but we need to connect the second part of the lesson here to this first one. Walk circumspectly and lay hands suddenly on no man. 1 Timothy 5, 22. Before we make a general uh, connection there, let's notice that P Paul writes this in the context of elders. But if you look closely at it, it's very obvious that it applies more than just that. However, we would point out <clears throat> that there has been some times when uh, if brethren would not lay hands suddenly on a man to... Uh, install him <clears throat> in the office of an elder, we could save ourselves a lot of heartache. We could save ourselves a lot of being led astray. And we might could save some errors that crop up like, well, after we put them in, let's vote and see if they're popular enough to stay in. Lay hands suddenly. Oh, no man. There's a connection between the latter part of 1 Timothy 5.22 and Ephesians 5. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Paul say back in Ephesians 5, that there are some things that are not to be named even once among you as Christians. Don't be partakers of other men's sins. How many times have you seen someone give their support, and that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about laying hands on someone. How many times have we seen someone give their support to another, and they're either one who is in uh, false doctrine, or they're living lives that are not right in the sight of God, and it's not very long till that person who gave them their support is either teaching exactly what they're teaching at false or they're living in the exact same way that that individual is living and it's sin. It happens over and over and over again. Now there is a conjunct between Ephesians 5.15 
in 1 Timothy 5.22. That is, walk circumspectly and lay hands suddenly on no man. And here it is. It's just as, as, as plain as, as it can be. If we lay hands suddenly on some person who is undeserving, then we find ourselves in the, the negative position that Paul describes in Ephesians 5.15. And here we are, we are not reproving the unfruitful works of darkness, but we are committing those unfruitful works of darkness. We find ourselves in fellowship with those things that sever our fellowship with God. And so when we fail to walk precisely and accurately and diligently, and we go out here and just give our support to, to just whoever uh, makes an impression upon us, we're putting ourselves in very serious jeopardy. But this walking circumspectly, I want to come back to that because this is so, so important. Walking circumspectly requires at least three things. First of all, it requires knowledge of the Scripture. We often quote 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I, I full well realize that the word study there would be more accurately translated as give diligence. That's what it means. But I would also point out that the latter part of the verse says, rightly dividing the word of truth. How in the world are we going to rightly divide the word of truth if we don't know it? And which, by uh, our reasoning, we understand that means that we have to study it. Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, for this cause, we also since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then, of course, there is that lofty verse of Acts 17.11 where we find those Bereans who were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things they were told were so. And, of course, they found that they were so, as Paul instructed them. Now, I can't know what God wants me to do. I can't know how God wants me to live. I cannot know how God wants me to walk. I won't know how to walk circumspectly unless I study the scriptures. But how many of us really do that like we should how many of us don't do it at all? How many of us say, well, I don't have time? Are there something or other that comes in our way? We're jeopardizing our souls if we don't know the truth. I have never known anyone in my lifetime, and I'm in my 60s now, I've never known anybody to accidentally obey the gospel of Christ without ever having taught it, been taught it, or studied it out for themselves. I've never really known anybody that walked as God would have them to walk without studying out in the scriptures or having someone to show it to them. It just doesn't happen. We don't accidentally do what God wants us to. We have to know. We have to study it. We have to understand it. Well, the second thing is that just knowing it's not enough. I have to have a desire to do that which God would have me to do. David wrote, of course, in that lofty 119th Psalm, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes, as verse 5. That's because David knew that it is the law of the Lord that converts the soul. He expressed that in Psalm 19, 7, didn't he? And... Uh, 
Peter also writes concerning this same subject. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And of course, having a knowledge of that word, the desire to do it, still not enough. There's a third thing that we have to do. We have to do it. Brother Dub mentioned Luke 6, 46 while ago, didn't he? Why call you me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. Won't do you any good. He described that in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Those who walk circumspectly. James, of course, in James 1, 22 through 25, has such a beautiful statement about this. Not being hearers of the word only, but being doers of the word. That is the person who shall be blessed in his deed. It's not the individual who knows what it says. It's not the person who says, well, I'd like to do what it says. But it is the individual who does what it says. And what's what James calls this in which the man is to walk, that which he is to do. It is the perfect law of liberty. Can we say walking circumspectly? I think we can. Because you see this law, it's a law to begin with. And that's another subject too, isn't it? For how many people in this world do they say we're not under any law? Oh yes, we are. We are under the perfect law of liberty. Now let's do a little bit of reasoning here. I'll do my Terry Hightower impersonation. If it's a perfect law of liberty, then that suggests that there are some things that are a part of that law. And if that law with those things associated with it are perfect, and I do that, what's it going to make me? By the grace of God, it's going to make me perfect. It's going to make me complete. It's going to make me sinless. When a person obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ, his sins are washed away. He's sinless. He's perfect in the eyes of God. Now, we're not perfect human beings, and so we're going to do that from time to time, which is against that perfect law of liberty. There's going to be times when we don't walk circumspectly as we should. That's when we need to turn back to God and, and ask Him for forgiveness, repenting of our sins. So when we look at this whole thing, walking circumspectly and laying hands suddenly on no man... And we key in on this walking circumspectly, understanding by that that we mean accurately and precisely and diligently anyone in the sound of our voice this very night who has not done that which the Bible says he must do. Not what man says he must do, but what the New Testament says he must do in order to have his sins remitted. Needs to think about this very carefully. You can search the New Testament from cover to cover and you will never find the New Testament saying either out of the mouth of the Lord himself or one of the apostles or other New Testament writer except Jesus as your personal Savior and your saved. You won't find it once. But you will find a number of times when the New Testament says, and we've mentioned some of these already, that the New Testament says that upon believing that Jesus is the Christ, one repents of his sins, he confesses his faith in Jesus Christ, and he's buried in baptism for the remission of his sins, washed clean and pure of them by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's walking circumspectly to become a child of God. But what about that individual 
who's done those things and he's not remained faithful. We always think of old Simon the sorcerer and how he tried to buy the gift of laying on of hands to impart the Holy Spirit with money. And Peter told him to repent and pray God. That's what we do if we do that as the children of God, something that is, that is against his will. We want to offer the invitation, and it's not our invitation. Let's understand this, and let's let all people understand this. This is not the invitation of the Church of Christ. This is the invitation of God. This is the invitation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was the, the very first one to say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And it is not the plea of the church of Christ that an erring child of God repent of that sin, confess it, and ask God for his forgiveness. James 5, 16 and 1 John uh, ver, uh, chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 or 8 through 11 it's the New Testament that teaches that and so we extend the invitation of Christ of God we extend the invitation to those who have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ or those who have wandered away from it and this is what one must do the New Testament says so it's not me it's not any other preacher in this audience. It's not the good elders here that are saying that. It's not their doctrine. It's of God. You might be here this evening and you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. If so, you're in your sins. And you need to obey that gospel. You may be here and you have not been faithful to our Lord. You need to make that right. You need to confess that. Need to repent of it, turn away from it, and ask God for his forgiveness. Are you subject to the invitation? If you are, will you come as we stand and sing the invitation song?